Moving a little bit more into feedback, because that is a very important concept in general whenever we're dealing with students in that online environment. They need that feedback to grow. So from your perspectives as uh, online Chinese instructors, Mandarin Chinese instructors, um, Peng Laoshi, let's start with you on this one, please. And this is, again, talking more about feedback. But whenever you are providing that feedback in an online environment, how do you give feedback to students that is going to benefit them? Um, how do you give them the feedback that's going to help them grow, especially for their student that maybe is struggling with Mandarin Chinese? And how do you make that feedback effective for them? Mm -hmm. uh, the, to make the feedback effective for them and also, also for the teacher is equally important. So uh, when I give feedback, it's usually um, probably three kinds of feedback. The first one is um, after grading or after going over all the exercises or uh, the uh, projects of students, then I find some of the common, uh, for example, areas that they need to improve. So I will probably record a tutorial for uh, uh, um, three to five minutes. Uh, that's, um, uh, that's some of the common issues I noticed. So that's a, that's a quick uh, tutorial. And then uh, number two, uh, for individual students, I provide two types of feedback. One is pedagogically, um, I usually uh, control myself in making sure I only provide comprehensible feedback that is um, really essential to the uh, growth of the students at this, um, at this point. Um, and then not overwhelm them with uh, the types of uh, uh, corrections or uh, improvements they need. So I limit it to two to three points uh, language in their language use. It may have to do with uh, accuracy or the fluency, or it may have to do with uh, sometimes prosody or you know sentence um, uh, uh, parsing where where the pause and so on and so forth. Um, the last type of feedback is also individualized uh, feedback. Uh, I pay a lot of attention to students' emotional uh, support. Uh, how does, when I grade the students' uh, work uh, based on our interaction in the synchronous uh, meetings, um, what did I observe? Um, what do I, uh, you know, what are the behaviors of the students? Um, if uh, the, a student is uh, not paying attention or they are lagging behind, or sometimes they miss uh, the online meetings. So I'll probably ask, uh, uh, provide them more emotional support uh, as uh, appropriate. So these are the three types of feedback. And all three essentially are important. It, the shift that I've noticed, especially since the pandemic, is there is that importance of caring for the whole student and making sure that they know that if they're coming to these live sessions, this is a place where they're expected that they're not going to be perfect. And this is all about growth. So making sure that they know that they're welcome and it's okay if they make mistakes. I love that you mentioned the idea of making a quick tutorial video that really summarizes what are the common things that I'm seeing that students are struggling with. And that can be a game changer. I've noticed that whenever I have put these wrap up videos at the end, especially addressing areas where students are struggling, when we're moving to the next lesson, I'm not seeing so much of those same patterns repeating over and over again, they're making the same mistakes. And that's great to see other people have implemented that. I found that that has been very helpful. So thank you for sharing that. That's all really good feedback. And of course, giving that individual feedback too for the students so they can grow. I, I like thinking about it as three different types of feedback. Great examples, thank you. We'll pass to Wang Laoshi again, the same question, and this is dealing with providing feedback to our students in the Mandarin Chinese courses in that online environment. So how do you provide the feedback that they need in order to grow, and how do you also more specifically help the students who might be struggling with Mandarin Chinese? Okay, very good. Um, so for, for example, you know, like uh, um, uh, for speaking kind of a, uh, you know, practice that I, you know, assess, you know, on a weekly basis, a uh, video project. So um, after, you know, kind of studying the materials, you're expected to write a video script and then record themselves and put together a short movie um, as assessment. And each student is asked to use like a 10 new words and a grammar patterns to write a movie script and then film it. Uh, I put it, you know, the website we use, it's called nowswimmingfish.com, and they have, uh, you know, four different levels 
uh, for Mandarin Chinese study and they can study at home. So um, for my class, I use a flip model. So they study the content for a beginning level. They will study, you know, conversation topic. Let's say this week we study uh, how to improve from a restaurant. And then they have the list of, you know, uh, work apps, the list of uh, all the possible sentences you can use. And it's an audio book, so you can access it on a tablet, on a phone, on a computer, different format. Um, and after they study it, um, at the end, you know, of each unit, each web page, it lists, you know, a simple question that um, ask them to put together a dialogue and a monologue that they're using like a 10 or 15 new words they learn from the topic. Um, so they can follow that instruction. And then I give them the, the detailed the grading rubric. So they know exactly uh, the expectation and they can also do a self-evaluation before turning in their final work uh, on our uh, CMS system, which we use uh, e-learning. Uh, when I grade their final draft, I use the rubric to assess student pronunciation, fluency, confidence, speech flow, cultural appropriateness, uh, using the language and the creativity. Um, so to address students' need, I give a very detailed and individualized feedback according to the problems of the student video and script. So each student know exactly what they did well, which, you know, areas that would mark, you know, let's see, um, pronunciation is good, you know, uh, but you need to work on fluency, it's too choppy. So I'll tell them exactly, you know, which part of the video that they do well and which part they didn't do well that they needed to do and what they need to do to improve. Uh, and those are feedbacks are very individual. Uh, for example, a student may struggle pronunciation like falling, rising tone, I would put, you know, um, well, or all your speech flow is good, you know, I can understand it, but your tones are kind of rude. Uh, I'll pick, you know, the mispronunciations from the video and send my correction telling the student a few tips to practice. In future, for example, you need to go back to the announcementfish.com and on which web page and they listed, you know, the correct pronunciation and you click on that video clip and just listen to it a couple of times and then record it back to me and to show, you know, um, your improvement. Or if you have questions, you can also record back to me and uh, ask me for more, you know, feedback. So that way that you know, or um, during on the on the road that they can uh, make a progress. So, um, and uh, I also uh, sometimes so occasionally if they couldn't, you know, figure out that I would record myself and how, you know, like uh, this is how you need to demonstrate how they should say it. If they after listening to the audio clips online and they tried their own effort and still couldn't figure it out, I would, uh, you know, demonstrate how to how to do that. Excellent. And I really like how the online environment is so conducive for going back and revisiting because it does take you, I'm sure, a fair amount of time to go back and record things for students. But then once you've done that, they have it. So they don't have to keep going back to you and saying, Wong Lao Shi, I still can't say this word correctly. Can you please say it over and over again? Well, they can just go back and revisit that recording. So I, I do love that aspect of being online with students. I also like how you mentioned the rubrics and kind of having students do a little bit of a self-assessment. I, I love the idea of having students take a look at what they're submitting and doing their own self-assessment, seeing where they're at, looking at what the expectations are, making them very clear to students, and then having them look at their submissions and say, okay, here's where I'm at. Am I meeting all of these criteria and making adjustments as needed rather than having to submit something, hope that it's correct, and ultimately maybe having not quite the expectation they were hoping for for their grade. So I really do like the idea of having that self-assessment. Thank you for that. And Koslo Shu, we'll go ahead and pass it to you. And the question, again, same question, whenever you are providing feedback in that online environment, how do you provide students with the feedback they need to continue to grow? And also, if you have a student who's particularly struggling with something, how do you address that in online feedback? Sure, that's those are good questions and, and big questions, too. I think feedback is one of those things that everybody everybody does and often assumes will work and it doesn't work the way we think it will. And then we're frustrated by it, but we don't we don't we're not thinking critically enough about it. I think there's two things about feedback that are, that are really important 
for teachers to remember. The first one is just because you give it doesn't mean they're going to take it. And, you know, I have had colleagues for years and years and years who, you know, take a stack of papers home and they put all these marks all over it and they invest hours and hours and hours and hours of their life. And then their students don't look at it. And they feel really frustrated, as one might expect, um, sort of not understanding why their students are not engaging with the feedback. And then you get the converse. On the other side, you get sometimes where teachers know they're not going to give detailed feedback on every single thing that students do, because that's not possible. But students have these expectations that, you know, if I do something, you should put a grade on it. You should put feedback on it. You should talk to me about it, which like, on the scale of one student is possible, but on the scale of multiple classes, multiple levels every single day is just not practical. So one of the first important things about feedback is to have a good sort of plan for how you're going to do feedback and to communicate that to the other people involved, whether that's students, parents, if you're a team of language teachers to have some consensus among your department or your program so that you're giving kind of a unified message around when we give feedback, why we give feedback, how we give feedback, so that there's not sort of this disparity of work between colleagues. But I think feedback at its core, there's a quote by a, an assessment expert in education named Dylan William, who I, which I really, really like, which is the purpose of feedback is it should lead to its own redundancy. In other words, you're giving people feedback, not so that they rely on you giving them feedback all the time, but so that they know how to do the thing they're trying to do better so that they can do it better by themselves. The point is that feedback leads you to learning, which will improve your performance so that you can do it independently and so that you can self-monitor, right? That you're, a, like we like to say in fancy terms, a self-regulated learner. So I think the more you can share the burden of the feedback, you can train your learners age appropriately and level appropriately to do things like self-assess, uh, peer assess, to give feedback to the entire class, not always to individual students on every single individual thing that they do. The more you share that capacity building for becoming self-regulated. And I think that's really important. And on, on top of that, I think, I guess the way that I think about feedback is it sort of has six traits that I think make it effective. And I'll share a link there in the chat so teachers don't have to remember this forever. But the first thing is that the feedback is desired. If the person receiving the feedback doesn't want it, then it doesn't matter that you gave it, they're not going to engage. So if they don't trust you, if they are if they are not looking for your feedback, you giving it is a waste of time because they're not going to want it anyway. So one thing sounds really simple that I started doing with my students was asking them, did they want feedback on this particular assignment? And often you'd get students who knew that they stayed up really late the night before and they sped through the assignment right before class just to get it done. And they knew it wasn't a reflection of their best work. So they said, you know, not on this one. I'm good on this one. Versus there would be other times where I, I, get, I used to give students options. And I learned this from a, a colleague, Meredith White. Um, give them the option to opt out. No feedback, please. You can give them the option just to say something that I did really well. You can give me the option of something that I did really well and something that I need to improve on, just one thing, right? Or you can you can like tear it up, like give me all the criticism in the world and I'll take it all, I'm ready for all of it. But giving students that sense of agency and that sense of choice, what I found is number one, you never get students consistently picking the same thing. So you don't get students who always say, no feedback, no feedback, no feedback. And you don't get students always saying, I want you to give me the most detailed feedback possible. Students make different choices. And I think that's a really nice way of ensuring that the feedback is desired, right? So that's the first thing. They have to want it. The second one is that it's timely, right? And in an online space, especially in asynchronous space, that can be challenging. Um, but as close as possible to when the event took place is going to make it more likely that they relate the feedback to the thing that it's about. Um, the feedback has to be comprehensible. And in that sense, I don't mean just linguistically comprehensible, but often metalinguistically comprehensible. We say things to students like, your prosody is wrong. They don't know what prosody means. You have to be really student friendly, not a linguist, not using this technical jargon. Textbooks are abysmal at this. They use really technical language and they tell students that they're that this is a particle. That doesn't mean anything to anybody who's not a, a linguist with a PhD. So making sure that what you tell students is understandable to them, that they know what you're saying and why you're saying it and what they're supposed to do with it. The next one is that it's actionable. In other words, I know what I'm supposed to do, right? You're saying 
your tones are wrong. That doesn't tell me anything. Telling me what to do, how to do something differently is the only way that I'm possibly going to make use of your feedback. Um, the next one is, do I have an opportunity to use it? Right. It's, so we say, oh, students don't pay attention to feedback, but humans take the easiest path, right? We take the path of least resistance. So if there's no opportunity for me to apply the feedback, why should I read it? Right. What, it, what is my motivation to engage with your feedback if I can't use it? If you say, well, you should have done this. I don't have a time machine. I can't go back in time and change that. I didn't do that. So unless you're going to give me another opportunity to do something similar, I'm not going to read that feedback. I'm not listening to you because I can't change it anyway. And then, so you as a teacher want to make sure that you have the opportunity to apply it. And then when they have that opportunity, then you hold them accountable for having done it, right? And that can be as simple as what I do with my college students is I ask them, how did you use, what feedback, what recent feedback have did you use on this assessment or this task? Explain it to me. And that's a reflection question that they do post-assessment, right? Then they can say, well, you told me yesterday that I should use more connectors to perform more like an intermediate. And look, I used seven. And I go, wow, you, you clearly read my feedback. You, you used it, right? But all of those things together, as important as each of those traits are, if, it, if the practice of giving feedback is not sustainable for you, the teacher, and the practice of getting and using the feedback is not sustainable for them, the student, none of this matters. It could be the best feedback in the world. And if you have 5,000 students and it takes you three hours every single day to give all of them feedback, which would be great for 5,000 students probably actually, it's not going to happen. So you have to find the balance between what's ideal and what's realistic for you in terms of sustainability. And uh, a colleague of mine shared with me once this idea of four quarters feedback. So 25%. And these percentages are not like super scientific, but I think it's a nice way of thinking about sharing that burden of feedback. So 25% is me, the teacher to individual students. In other words, 25% of the stuff you do in a semester, you can expect that I'll give you individual independent feedback on. 25% is I'm going to look at everybody's performance, their assessment, their formative assessment, their exit ticket, whatever, but I'm not going to give feedback to you as an individual person. I'm going to give feedback to the whole class. This is where we are. These are the things we're struggling with. This is what we're going to do about it. 25% is you giving feedback to a peer. And that requires a lot of scaffolding. But once you teach them how to do it, once you teach them what to look for, and in those spaces, I tend to have students only focus on the positives, right? I don't need you telling your peer you're bad at Chinese. I want you to be saying, wow, you use so many connector words and noticing the things that some that I can learn from my peer. And then 25% is yourself. It's self, it's reflection, it's self-assessment. It's taking the rubric that Wang also just mentioned and grading myself on one band of the rubric or on the entire rubric. And it's taking, internalizing the idea of, regulating your own learning and being sort of this community of learners because feedback is really hard. Everybody has lots of expectations around feedback. Students think they that you should be doing certain things. Your peers, your colleagues think you should be doing certain things. Parents think you should be doing certain things. Administrators think feedback works a certain way. And what we know, what both of the people here with PhDs in second language acquisition also know really well is feedback is maybe the messiest piece of second language acquisition literature research that we have. We don't know much about feedback. We know basically in one sentence, some feedback works sometimes on some structures for some learners, which is kind of a useless thing to say, right? So we don't have it all figured out, but it is, it is a super important practice. We know that it matters, but balancing what's possible with what's necessary and ensuring that we maximize the opportunity for students to actually do something with it, I think is the only way that it's worth even thinking about. Well, that statement was really accurate. The, we know that feedback sometimes works some of the times for some things, and it's so accurate. It's just so accurate. I really like how you're giving us these, these guidelines to use and also the idea about kind of dividing the feedback into four quarters, but ultimately putting a significant amount of the ownership on the student to do that self-reflection, giving themselves the feedback that they need to continue to improve and, and learning how to do that 
ultimately we want to empower our students so that they feel that they're able to continue on with their studies and kind of dictate to themselves. These are the areas that I know that I'm struggling with. Let me focus here rather than the stuff that I'm already doing well on. That was fantastic. 